Hello and welcome to Odds and Ends, Part 2. In this episode, we'll cover the domestication of mink, tobacco, and rainbow trout. Let's start with mink. Mink is a species of weasel called Neovision Vision. In Canada, domestication of the mink began in 1866 and expanded from there. In fact, it began in my home province of Ontario. The paper by Dr. Morris of Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada hoped to analyze the full genetic diversity of the species and here are the results. It was found that, despite beginning very early on in terms of breeding for pelt production, there is a wide difference between the amount of genetic diversity between both captive and wild populations. And wild samples found near farms and wild samples in farms have a great level of genetic variation differences. I was also found that there's a low level of variation within functional genes within the American mink. I was found that androgen receptor genes, which regulate the flow of testosterone in terms of behavior patterns, have been altered with only the variants of that gene that correspond to low aggressivity. And various different breeds of mink from the earliest strains to the latest strains show a general decline in terms of aggressive behavior. It was also found that the uh, domesticated mink have been bred for faster growth rate for better fur production. As a result, one of the genes responsible for the growth rate, IGF-1, has been mutated through the breeding process with the mutations being selected for to speed up the growth rate, although it comes with the cost of physical abnormalities such as altered metabolism, altered physical structure, and loss of hearing. While in the wild mink, only a very narrow set of parameters for that gene are allowed. And overall, the captive mink has a very low gene pool in comparison to the wild counterparts. This is due to artificial selection and lots and lots of inbreeding due to the fact that most of the color variations are recessive and need to be bred through inbreeding. As a result, to maintain certain levels of health within the mink populations, the frequent capture of wild mink to bulk up the genome through crossbreeding still occurs to this day. Now onto tobacco domestication. In a paper by Dr. Tushinkam of Washington State University, it was found that tobacco was actually domesticated in the South America region of the Andes between 6,000 to 8,000 years ago. Continuous breeding based on current genetic evidence suggests that the species Nicotinia rustica and Nicotinia tobaccum or common tobacco are derived from these early domestication efforts. It spread throughout the Americas through the Mesoamerican empires, eventually reaching what would be known as the southwestern United States between 2500 to 3500 years ago BP. Although wild tobaccos were used mostly by the Western North American people, based on current ethnobotanical evidence, tobacco has been historically used primarily for religious or cultural rituals, and very few pieces of tobacco are found in archaeological records due to the fact that they're combusted, ultimately destroying the material. Utilizing different techniques, the researchers attempted to find remnants of nicotine on ancient pipes found in North American dig sites, and they successfully found a few such pipes that had such residues on it. These pipes date back between 2,500 years and 500 years BC. These are found in the Mid-Columbia and Snake River regions within North America. These are the earliest known examples of nicotine consumption within the North American region, indicating that the minimum time period of the origin of tobacco smoking within North America is 2500 BC. Now on to trout domestication. The rainbow trout, or Orcorhinus mycus, are naturally found between northern Mexico to Alaska. But in the last two centuries, they've been domesticated and spread all across North America. These domesticated strains seem to have poor 
reproductive success in comparison to their wild counterparts, as well as rapid growth, reduced swimming performance, and higher levels of aggression. Different captive breeders have been making alterations through selective breeding, utilizing inbreeding, genetic drift, and selection. In a captive hatchery, for instance, more variations can occur and survive due to the more lax environment that they find themselves in, i.e. no predators, no seasonal change, and the high amount of food that's readily available. They're also treated for most diseases. This allows for both immunocompromised and healthy fish to thrive in the same environment. But there are some selective pressures. Due to the high density population, there's more interspecies competition for food, higher levels of stress, and easier time for various diseases to spread, which explains the current traits of our modern farmed fish in terms of rainbow trout. Utilizing cloning mechanisms, Dr. Polsini studied the genetic changes that happen through captive breeding over a long period of time. Using the wild species found in Whale Rock, Clearwater, Swanson, and Klamath, and the domesticated forms found in Arley and Hot Creek. Here are the results. The genetic and morphological expressions of captive bred versus wild strains of rainbow trout are quite similar surprisingly enough, and there is not that great of a divergence between populations. And the author argues it's hard to tell if it's fully domesticated or not. There appears to be a lot of genetic plasticity in the sense that different environments cause the genes to express a lot differently depending on the environment when it comes to rainbow trout. Well, that book covers everything. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching this video. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to me on BitChute for a greater variety of content, four videos a week. And thank you to all my subscribers on both platforms. I appreciate it.